Can I guess? Um, I have a question in, in terms of the load shedding. My schedule says around about at seven, there will be load shedding and usually my connection is bad. So will that not yeah, affect my Yeah, we know that you're also experiencing load shedding, but it's not a problem. It's fine if you're on load shedding. It's okay. I'm recording the sessions. So I will share, I'll, I'll share the sessions with you. We are unfortunate no, are asking, if it's, in load if, shedding and if, we cannot if it's not going to affect the lectures. Okay. And it's Thank not going to affect my attendance. Okay, we will finish at half past eight. So you can come back and check if we're still here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I just have a question. Yes. Um, what if maybe there's a low shedding and someone is disconnected? Uh, are we going to be allowed to be uh, rejoined? Uh, the yeah, class? You can rejoin. You can rejoin. If you can rejoin, it's fine. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's low shedding. We are all experiencing it. Well, we hope. I'll be because... off at half past six, but when I come back, I will. I will continue. All right, ma'am. Okay. Uh, are you done, Zukiso? Yes, Elsie, you may proceed now. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you are interested in seeing me. I'm just, my concern is that we stay uh, together as we flow with the lecture. Uh, it is quite a lot that we have to get through. Wow. So I will be on camera a bit. And then uh, I think my priority is to make sure. Can you see me? Yes. Can you yes. Yes. yes, we can see you. Okay. So I will yes, be on camera, but uh, because you know I'm also at home, I don't want to distract you with uh, people moving. <laughs> like the earlier pictures that we saw on here. So <laughs> I'm I'm gonna keep my my, my video off but I'm with you. So for the sake of uh, progress, um, my focus is to ensure that you can see the slides. Really, if you would like to see my face, you can tell me if you forgot how I look like. <laughs> you can ask to see me. But uh, my name is Elsie Sebe, and uh, I'm a senior legal practitioner with the Legal Aid South Africa. Also, uh, a seasoned uh, practitioner in, in the subject of criminal court practice and also in facilitating this course. Um, I've been doing this uh, for a number of years, I think should be going around five to six years with LEAD. And uh, it's actually my first time that I'm presenting with the UNISA uh, long distance LEAD. But uh, I, my intention with the course is to, to make sure that uh, I'm not here to repeat what you have learned in school with uh, your criminal law courses at university. Mine is to make criminal court to be practical, I mean, criminal court practice to be practical for you so that for those of you who might not you know, have had an idea what uh, this course is about, at least at the end of this course, you may find yourself in a position where you are now reconsidering maybe to even actually become a practitioner in criminal law. But I'm here to give you a very uh, broad uh, understanding of what happens when you are a criminal law practitioner. And I will do my best uh, to ask that you know, I've, I'll give you everything that I know, but I'm also going to ask that uh, if you have questions, uh, please don't feel like you are interrupting. I like it when the sessions are interactive because you may think of something that I didn't think of when I was preparing for the course. So I will appreciate maybe if you've seen something, 
and you just want to maybe get clarity whether that is the right way that it is, uh, or maybe if you would want to to know whether you know that is what you are likely to experience when you are in practice. So overall, I don't mind if you you interrupt me, and I actually ask for you to engage so that the sessions can be even more interesting for all of us. Criminal court practice is a very broad subject. So I started uh, by going into the general background and, and give you basically an introduction. Generally, uh, for, for, for most uh, legal practitioners, they think that, you know, criminal law only has to do with criminals and, you know, scumbags and, you know, people who are tormenting society. But I would like to let you know that, in fact, criminal court uh, practice, it can apply to all of us. Every human being actually can find themselves either directly, you know, affected in that they are, you know, brushing up against the law. And even at times, it may not be through their deliber deliberate actions. That can also happen when um, you find a situation where, you know, it may be accidental, you know, without any intention on your part. So it's not only for for criminals that you would, you know, think that when you are in this field of practice, you are only going to deal with what normally people call them bad people in society. So I like to give example of a situation where, yes, there may be someone who may go out of their way because uh, of whatever circum personal circumstances that they may have, they may feel that uh, maybe they are unemployed, they are hungry, and they find themselves next to a shop and the food is smelling very nice, you know, they may go in there and actually steal something. So they may not have left their house planning to go out and steal, but because of the situation, they found themselves without any money, then they may steal. Or it may be you. Maybe you are just coming from a get together with a group of friends, you know, and you are on your way. And, you know, while you were together, wherever you were, you indulged and imbibed, you know, some beverages which are having, you know, intoxicating capabilities. You know, so, and unfortunately for you, before you reach your home, you may be stopped by the police and, you know, they may actually find that you are driving under the influence of, you know, alcohol, for instance. You may be an upstanding person. We know of judges who've, you know, found themselves in that situation in the past. You know, upstanding members of community have found themselves, you know, uh, arrested, you know. So I like to just broaden your view of criminal uh, practice by giving these examples to show you that in criminal law, we are not only just dealing with people who are just going around robbing, stealing, and raping. Sometimes it's really just ordinary folks like you and me who may actually be in that unfortunate uh, situation where now they have to be standing in a dock in a court and needing now a lawyer who will be, you know, uh, there to assist to get them off from, a, a, you know, a possible, you know, time of imprisonment or even conviction. Sorry, sorry, guys. So the general sources of our criminal law, as a, a, it stands in our law, we have multiple sources where we get our law. And the first source that we have in criminal law, it's the constitution. And why I say 
uh, the constitution is the number one go-to source, not the Criminal Procedure Act, as many of you might have thought, not all the criminal law amendment acts and whatever legislations that are related to criminal law. It's because all these legislations that are criminal law related were actually founded out of the provisions of the constitution. The constitution, particularly section 35, has detailed for us um, the rights of arrested, detained persons, and the rights that uh, such people have when they are to undergo a trial. The rights to equality, to mention a few, dignity and privacy. So all these rights are contained in the, in the constitution, but nothing specifically says criminal law when you read this section, but when you read into it and you get to understand what the legislature was talking about, then you will see how they now directly relate to a criminal law. So the rights of an accused person, they do not just start when a person is arrested. In terms of our constitution, anytime a person before they are put under arrest, as we have seen on TV, on all these uh, uh, law dramas that are normally played out on TV, you will see from the moment the police and they meet up with a person whom is considered as a suspect, they immediately start telling them of their rights. So that is where you see how important the Section 35 is because that is where now the rights of an arrested person kick in, even if they are not yet at court, wherever they are, even if they are on the street, wherever they are at the crime scene, when they, they are caused this suspect and they now you know take up a decision that no this is a person that should be placed under arrest at that moment there is this person is now someone who has rights that are listed as per the constitution and they have to be abided to if the police don't abide by the provisions of section 35 even if the person was caught red handed if you know, that's what we say on the streets. If this person is later brought to court and questions arise about the explanation of their rights at the time of arrest, and it turns out that this person was not made aware of their rights, then this has a possibility of getting the whole entire state case to be thrown out of court. That is how much weight the court's place on uh, the provisions of that section 35. Even the treatment that a person is going to be given once they are in police custody, that is why it refers to detained persons. Those rights have to be abided to. And if there's any deviation where the police, they do not comply with the requirements of section 35, Say, for example, a person who's detained is being assaulted by the police to coerce them to agree to having maybe committed the offense or to get them to be uh, admitting to certain criminalities. That can also be exposed in the court that this person, yes, they have made these admissions, but the circumstances under which those uh, admissions were made or confessions while they were detained by the police. If the circumstances point to the fact that it wasn't voluntary or there was any force that was applied to make them to, to come out with that kind of information, it will throw out the case. So I hope <clears throat> now uh, you see the link with uh, the constitution. So. On uh, this part, I just mentioned this few rights that are contained in the constitution, but the, the, there's a lot of uh, rights that are contained in, this, in, this, uh, in the constitution. And particularly if you check in the Bill of Rights, 
you can find that any of the rights can be violated and the such violation can actually lead to you know a criminal case so it depends on the type of case that you have so without you know wasting too much time on those uh, sections because here we are not really doing constitutional law you know you can take your time and just you know appraise yourself with the provisions of the constitution as they are because then you will have to see and you can imagine each and, and in each and every situation that would lead for you to be finding a person who's been arrested appears in a criminal court but their constitutional rights have been violated so that is how in most i can assure you in most of the case law that exists in this country reference is always highly possible like i i can't think i'm saying maybe definitely more than 95 percent of case law and even the, the cases that are in court on a daily basis they you'll find that the lawyers immediately they they talk in the court they are going to make reference to the provisions of the constitution so it is a very very uh, you know huge and uh, a big source of reference that we have in criminal uh, court practice and mm. Yeah, it applies a lot. That's the point I'm trying to make. So, yes, of course, the rights that are contained uh, in the Constitution. We please, all... uh, Is there a question? Interject, uh, yeah, I yes. just want to, to check something as you said that uh, you are more than welcome to, to stop. Of course, me. of course. Yes, yes. interrupt me. Yes. Because I'm on the slides now. I can't even see. I have to get out. I don't know what okay. I've done here. Yeah, well, sorry. I, so I, I, I won't see your hand. Please try not to raise a hand. If you want to speak, just uh, speak up. Yes. Okay. okay. I just want to check two things. One, it, it relates to the rights of a person who gets to be arrested. Yeah. I just want to check this. If a person gets to be arrested on the street, Yes. For a particular crime, because there's a reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed. Yes. He's taken to a police van, is mm. only told of his or her rights yeah. at the police station. Is that a violation of Section 25 of the Constitution? Uh, that's number one. Number two, you have indicated that in an event that there's a violation of this Section 35, um, a person uh, in this instance, let me talk about the uh, what the peace officer or the, the police. Yes. Um, uh, you say that that is a criminal offense. Uh, with the knowledge that you have, do you know of any person who has ever been, uh, you know, charged for the violation of this? Because from where I am, I, I get to read or to hear about cases that get to be thrown out of the court simply because Section 25 uh, was not uh, complied with. Mm. Um, uh, now I'm just checking. And, and, and maybe lastly, I want to check if then can such a person be rearrested and be informed of his rights in terms of Section 35? Those three questions. Okay, uh, I'll try and, and remember all three of them. So as uh, you are asking, I was about to come to this part on the slide where I'm saying, you know, all the rights that are contained in the Constitution, we are aware that they are to be exercised, you know, still under limitation clause, that is Section 36. So what does that mean? In your question, you are saying... Uh, what rights do the police really have also to ensure that they don't just leave you know potential criminals just because we are being so strict about uh, the application of this section 35 the police also look if a matter comes before court and there's an issue regarding whether this person was informed of their rights police they record uh, their interactions they have also their uh, black books. That's what they used to be called. I don't know if the, the terms have changed, but they used to have like a, a pocket book 
where they record events and also there's forms that they complete when they normally they don't walk around with those forms on the streets for example so after they find a person maybe there was a crime scene and then they would take them to a, a charge office the police station then when they are there that's where they will sit down and complete all those questions whether you know to ensure that they have covered all the rights and once they have completed the forms the accused will also be given an opportunity to to be asked whether he understands or she understands the rights as they've been told to them and then they will then be asked to also sign if they can write to say that they understood what they were signing if there's a interpreter that is being used they will be mentioned that maybe there was a language barrier between the arresting officer and the, the suspect, then they will mention that they used services of an interpreter to make sure that the accused is aware of their rights. Now, to answer specifically whether the police can remove a person from the street to the police station and then only at the police station, the person will be told of these rights only when they reach the police station. The court will check the circumstances. Some crime scenes are very, uh, I can say, explosive. There's a lot of, you know, activity that will be there. There will be, a, you know, a lot of people that are present there. So the court will investigate as to the situation at the crime scene why these rights could not be told to the suspect at that time. But the point is that you cannot just make this person to go and spend the night in custody without, you know, book, after you book them in, they will be there until the next day. They still don't know the reason why they are there. So, yes, the police will just verbally tell them that we are taking you with us because, uh, you know, you are being a suspect on uh, this matter and we will continue to explain more when we get to the police station depending on the scene so yes there is some allowance that is given to the police to allow them to be able to do their work but that allowance cannot be so much that it also leaves a huge room for them abusing their power and not complying with the law as it as, as it is stated that every accused i mean every arrested person it means these rights have to be informed to this person at the time of arrest so if you fail to inform them at the time of arrest you have to be having a valid reason why you cannot tell them at that time and you have to make sure that the first available opportunity you have to share, you make sure that you've made them aware of their rights so if it happens that then you go to court and that becomes a, an issue in court this type of a situation will stop the court proceedings so that uh, the court can be clear that there hasn't been any violation of the rights of this arrested person so the court will enter into what is called a trial within a trial to go further and probe deeper onto the manner in which this person was arrested to find out whether there wasn't any possibility for uh, this police to have immediately informed this person of their, uh, their rights. Because every officer knows that immediately when you place someone under arrest, the first thing to do is to ensure that they are fully aware of their rights and they can be able to make informed decisions on what they, they will elect. A to do, so I will can later I ask a question. Yes, sorry, ma'am. Yes, uh, my question um, is: how can what you if prove the problem is how? the language barrier between the person being arrested and and the police? Uh, for instance, what if they are speaking English and I don't know English as um, as the person who who is being arrested? Then what what happens at that point? If there's a language barrier, because. Uh, it depends if this we are talking about locals because we also have foreign nationals as well. If the, the, the language barrier is so much that they, they cannot get each other completely, the police, they know that they have to get an interpreter to be involved because 
even if it's both South Africans, it may be someone, you know, from, uh, say, from Limpopo who speaks only Venda, and the police officer is only Zulu speaking, so he cannot speak a word of Venda. It can happen. So then they have to get an officer who can be able to assist because you cannot say that you have informed an, an accused person of their rights if they, it's not just to inform, they also have to understand what is the right and then they have to make selection of which right they want to exercise. So if there's a barrier, the barrier of language, they will try to get services of an interpreter who can assist. And if maybe there is no one who can assist with interpretation, it will be indicated in those forms that that was the challenge that they had. So that when we come to court, that they will be asked, why was this person, you know, the prosecutor will also question them, why was this person not read their rights? But in all instances, they may even use family members. If maybe there's family members of the suspect at the time of arrest, if maybe the person is not very conversant in that language, to make sure that at least the basic rights have been explained and this person is able to understand what their rights are. But if it's going to have such a detrimental effect on their decision, like for instance, the accused will say, if I knew I would have decided otherwise, but because I didn't understand or I didn't know, then it may become an issue. So it's a matter for you as a legal practitioner to decide whether this was really an issue that you need to further, you know, dwell on or, but if you find that, you know, it wasn't that they deliberately made it that there was an issue, with a explanation of these rights. But I know that the police generally, they do make all efforts to ensure that they find someone who can assist with, with interpretation because they know those rights are at the time of arrest. You know, yeah. so that is crucial and it must be covered. You cannot skip that part. That part. Oh, I was um, asking a question. Um... How do you prove um, that the, the rights weren't uh, read to the uh, suspect or the accused person? And when and during the um, is it during the first appearance or when do you actually bring that about uh, before the court? In most instances, when the accused are arrested, the lawyers are not there. That is generally what happens in about ninety five percent of the cases. The lawyers are not there. You would only be called after the person has already been detained at the police station, or you will actually meet them at the holding cells. You know, when you are, you know, called by a family member to say, please, this person is appearing at so and so court, then you will go there and you will meet them at the court cells. So obviously, because you were not there, this is why we do this course, so that we tell you that you need to probe from your client whether their rights were explained to them, find out the manner in which they were arrested, so that you can see whether they were not harassed in any way. So you will hear from your client. If they say that, no, I was not told of any rights, then you will go into the docket at a later stage. You just note it for your notes, right? Because remember, this matter is still going for trial. So you won't make a big noise about it and say, no, 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 no. This case must not proceed anymore. My client says he was not informed of his rights. No, you will allow the, the legal process to unfold. But when you get your opportunity now, maybe uh, at the stage where you are starting the trial and then now the state is presenting their evidence, now you will challenge them with this also as one of your points of attack to say whatever that you are trying to use as a, you know, an ammunition against my client. That information was obtained by you not informing my my client of their rights fully, and also there was maybe some influence or force that was uh, impressed on my client. If this client was made aware of their rights, my instructions are that they would have taken a different stance instead of just you know admitting to some of the things that have been admitted and they try to use them in court against the accused to prove their case. Oh, Excuse me, so Mr. Sebe. 
Yes. Um, I also wanted then, to also. Um, can I, can can I, we I have one me? person talking, please? You just give. Okay, ma'am. As precious, yeah. I will be in low shading any time from now. So I just wanted to confirm if this uh, class will be recorded. That's what okay. Zukiso said. But she said okay. you need you need to come uh, back can I when when your load shading is over. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, ma'am. We are on. We are on until half past eight. So if you are okay. off at six, then try and check us around past eight. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, can I can I ask a question, ma'am, Lorato? Yes. Yes, Lorato. Um, is it possible that you can give us maybe some time after the lecture because maybe some of the questions that are being asked they can be covered along the way. So is it possible that maybe we can write our questions down and then maybe give us maybe about 20 minutes to ask questions after the No, lecture? don't worry. We have five, I'm, I'm, five I'm days. No, no problem. I hear you. But the thing is, we have five days. Because maybe some course. of the things that you are answering now might be covered yeah. along the lecture. Yes, but I don't I want you to, you know, that the situation is that sometimes you may forget something so no, I, I will when i see that we are dwelling too much on something i will push to move along so if i don't oh, want okay. to block people and say i'm suggesting that we... all right no i don't oh. want to block people and say i like i said i like the sessions to be interactive it's it's learning by interacting so like unfortunately for those who will not be here with us that's why Zukiswa said they're making I'm sure that you, we... Okay, but right. yeah, we can go along. If you have questions, let's try and keep them brief. We are still oh, on the first okay. slide. So I'm, I'm not going to say leave it until the end. Let's just be short with okay. our questions and not, not be repeating ourselves. I've got a question. Okay. okay. Uh, and it has a follow up question. My question is that. Or uh, in between. Sorry. Yes, we can ask. All right. Uh, my question is that does Section 35 uh, rights only afforded to police officers? Because in other instances where a person can be detained by, you know, in community watches, there's people that can arrest someone. Uh, I want to know at what point can you, as a legal practitioner, try to map out what it actually equivalent to an arrest? Okay, no, on the, on the part of arrests, we are still coming to that, but no, it does not only apply to police officers. We will also come to some definitions so that you can know the role of each officer, exactly what powers they have. So I think your answer will be more clear when we get to that part. So I, as you know, there's also what we popularly know as a citizen's arrest and all those things. So when we get to that part, it will become more clear for you. I also have a question, ma'am. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the gentleman who asked first, uh, mm. I see now we are proceeding. I think uh, one of the questions he asked is uh, to inquire if mm. you ever know of any officer who was once charged of violating section 35 look the decision to if the police have violated these rights the decision to charge it is entirely resting upon the person and also the manner in which they violated the rights will be an issue to check yes i know of many officers who have been charged criminally for violating the rights of an arrested person because they beat them up. So there's lots of instances where an accused will be beat up by the police and they also open a counter charge against the police because he says when they were arresting me, they were beating me up. So I know of many of those kind of instances. Yes. Okay. Um, say for, I understand beating up, say for not, you know, just informing them of their rights since you say it's a it's a it's, a, it's an offense C can an officer be charged for that except for assault and all these other i did not say it's an offense i said the violation of these rights by not informing the accused of these rights or for the police not to you know treat a suspect with you know a consideration for their rights of privacy, dignity, and whatever, they may not lead 
to a criminal charge in all instances. Sometimes it may lead to a civil suit, lawsuit. You understand? So you may have to make a merit assessment and check, do I have a criminal case on my hands or is this something that I must pursue, you know, following the civil procedure? So it's not always that, uh, like for instance, let's say the court has a, a case before them and there's an issue where there was no violence, but it is proven that this person was detained unlawfully. And that case, eventually the court, the criminal court will throw it out. Now you, as the, 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 the lawyer, you will advise your client that, look, there is no more a criminal case against you. But for the way you have been made to feel by being unfairly arrested and also being unlawfully detained, you know, you have rights to be protected against such. So decide whether you want to put in a civil claim against the police for their treatment, whereby they have not physically assaulted you, but they have caused you embarrassment because now, you know, people will sue, will see you as a criminal. And, you know, people saw how the police, you know, took you and they put you in a van and they went away with you. You know, they, they, they wouldn't be a public announcement when you come back, whereby everyone will, who was present at the time of arrest will be there and they will be told that no at court actually this this person was not found guilty so that they can see that you've been exonerated so if you feel that to your person because you have your own rights your dignity was impaired you know the way your integrity was affected the way people see you because you know it's people they generally jump to conclusions i mean just members of community they jump to conclusions that you are probably a criminal. Even though the court has found you not guilty, you still feel that uh, uh, I, 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 I must be paid for this humiliation that I've suffered. Then you may consider a civil claim against the state. I hope that answers you. Yes, I know it's clear, ma'am. Okay, so all those false arrests, that's what they are called. It's unlawful detention, unlawful arrests, and all those cases that were not even supposed to have been brought before the court. And there was no basis. You can sue both the police and the prosecutors who dealt with those cases without applying their mind to the facts. I, I, please, please mute your mic. If you don't have a question so i'm moving on ladies and gentlemen the second source that we have as i've touched on briefly uh, it's it's statutes this is our legislation and i've mentioned already that most people think that the number one source of criminal uh, court pro, uh, practice is of, of criminal law they assume that it will be the criminal procedure act Yes, we, in every criminal court, that is what is commonly used because it tends to be one of our only codified uh, instrument where we can find uh, our law concerning criminal court practice. So the act is old, as uh, you may see that it's coming from 1977. Amendments have been made a lot on it to try and to make it to keep up with the changes that are coming up. But it is our go-to guide when it comes to the procedure that we use in the criminal courts. And the next uh, instrument is, I also refer to this, the Criminal Law Amendment Act, also from 1997, already being amended several times as well. This one deals with your, your minimum sentences where uh, the court will set a sentence that the court is actually expected to impose once a person has been 
found guilty on those type of offenses. So if the court wants to deviate from a prescribed minimum sentence, then the court has to be given reasons whereby we, we have to say the court must deviate from imposing this prescribed minimum sentence and the only way they can do so if, is if there is what we call substantive and compelling reasons that the court can accept that I'm not going to follow this prescribed minimum sentence. I will be more lenient or I will be more, you know, uh, harsher. But there is a full table of those type of offenses. But just to mention a few, with your robberies, armed robberies, with your child rape, and uh, we already know that if a person, even if they are a first offender, the legislature has already said this person must be given 15 years for armed robbery, 25 to life for a child rape, for instance. So if the court is not going to impose that uh, sentence, it needs what is in, uh, I can say, in loose terms, it's very, very special reasons why the court must not impose that minimum sentence. This piece of legislation came up for those more serious offenses where there were too many discrepancies in terms of how the courts were sentencing. You would find in one jurisdiction, the court are giving a more hefty fine, but if it's another jurisdiction, you find that it's like a slap on the wrist. So the legislature then was called upon to come up with some form of uniformity to make sure that when we are dealing with these type of offenses and also the prevalence of those type of offenses will push for the legislation to be made because there's too many of those type of offenses happening in the country. Then to, and to, to, to assist those courts who find themselves unsure about how they should sentence in those cases, then they don't have to wonder. The legislation is there. If it's this type of offense, even the accused person will be informed from their very first appearance that the type of offense that you are appearing in this court today, it carries a possible minimum sentence of this nature. So they will be told they will be told from day one so that they can be, you know, making their decisions as they go along with the case, keeping in mind the possibility of those type of offenses of sentences that may be imposed upon them if they are found guilty. Criminal law and sexual offenses and related matters, uh, Amendment Act 32 of 2007, it also deals with sexual offenses that carry a term of uh, life imprisonment. Here we are referring to what is popularly known as body child rape. So if an ad a major or an adult person indulges in sexual conduct with a minor, or rather a child, let me say, a child, then there is set a punishment that must be imposed. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I will not read up all the legislations that we have in South Africa that find application in criminal law. I said in my introduction, I'm just showing you the popular sources that we, we use on a daily in criminal court practice. But I will want you to keep this in mind before I leave this slide about the statutes. Ne? Any piece of legislation in South Africa, even if it's not meant to be something that relates to criminal law, it can end up being a matter that comes before the court. I'll give you an example. 
look at our company laws. The company law relates to things that happen in an office, in boardrooms. It's all about transactions and things that are completely unrelated to a criminal. Sorry, can you please uh, mute? Who is that, guys? Please help me there. Let me see. And please lower your hand so that we, I've told you I'm not going to see the hands that are up. So the situation may be that there is a director who is doing his job as a company director. And because of the activities that are happening in the company or the way that they conduct the activities of the company, they may find themselves breaking the law and their actions may amount to criminal acts. Here I'm talking about a, where a director of a company defrauds the company, maybe with the finances. They are embezzling the funds, for instance, in the uh, the company account. They are stealing from the company. This is something that happened in some office park somewhere, and they were doing this as a director of a company. But because their actions have elements of criminality, then they can be charged and they will find themselves in a criminal court. So with those type of offenses that usually happen within a, a work environment or a corporate environment, there has been special courts that have been established to deal with uh, what is called commercial crimes. So there's courts that are focused. When you go there, you won't meet a body assault. You won't find anyone there charged with a malicious injury of property. They deal strictly with conducts of a corporate nature that have criminal uh, elements. So it will be fraud, it will be your corruption, it can be your money laundering, it will be whatever activities where criminality shows its head, its ugly head within a corporate setup. Then those cases will go and be heard in the commercial crimes court. Say, for example, even for citizens like us, who are taxpayers, you don't pay your tax, or you are stealing, you know, from the tax man by submitting falsified information to the tax man when it's time for filing of uh, tax returns. That's something that is, is uh, concerned with uh, the revenue services. But if there is uh, evidence that shows that, uh, you know, you, you defrauded or you stole, you know, by, by being defiant in your compliance with the laws of the country that says every eligible person who is supposed to pay their tax is supposed to do so, then you may find yourself also appearing in that uh, commercial crimes court. So, yeah, anything, guys, you can think. It can be labor law, it can be anything. I don't want to waste too much time on this issue, but I just wanted to show you that it's not only these three that I'm mentioning here that will lead to you being a exposed because most of uh, practitioners who are, you know, based in law firms that are doing corporate work, they, they tend to not think that uh, they will end, end up dealing with a, a corporate, co I mean, a criminal court. So anything, it can be medical law. I mean, guys, I can give you endless uh, 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 examples, but please know that anything can lead 
to a criminal court. Well, as long as there's an element of criminality. Yes. Hello, yes, Minir. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, while we are still on the statutes, mm. I want to understand the, the rationale on the typical case that we that was on the news of Sabangwani, who wanted to plead guilty and make confessions uh, to, her, to his crimes. But the, the prosecution opposed um, that plead guilty and they wanted to argue for a premeditated murder. And eventually the court uh, agreed with the prosecution. Which among these statutes did the, the prosecution use mostly? Did it use the CPA or all the, the statutes that are reflected on the slide? Like I said, the slides that are here is just a few. Each and every case is unique. That is why I'm giving you something that is totally unrelated to criminal law, like you paying your tax for SARS, filing your tax returns. It's based on the South African Revenue Services Act. So when you get a case, your client will come and give you a set of facts from the situation that has brought them to be finding themselves brushing up against the law. So you must cipher from the facts which law is likely to be at issue. The state will help you by putting a charge sheet together where they will say the charges that the accused will be facing, if it's a statutory offense or it's just a general offense that you will see from the charge sheet. But if you want to now formulate your defense and your strategies, you will have to also do your own research to see how you will counter what is contained in the chat sheet. So it calls on you to do your own research to see which law is applicable. That is why I said, when I show you with the constitution, section 35, I'm not saying only section 35 is the one that will be helpful in your case. Go and read all the provisions of the constitution so that you can see which one you can use in your case, because case differ from one to another. So even in this case that you are referring to, it will depend on what the, the prosecution have, and they will decide then which charges they are going with. And you as the defense lawyer, you will then consult with your client and tell them that, look, this is what the state is charging you with. But because Maybe the guy was saying he's guilty, like you say. You now have to seek, obviously, a lighter sentence for your client. So then your client doesn't know. If, for instance, I'm just giving a rough example. I'm not referring particularly to this case. For instance, the charge that initially the state had put was a robbery, armed robbery. Then your client admits that, yes, I did end up with these things, but I'm not the one who robbed. I know the people who robbed, and I got the stolen items from them or the robbed items from so-and-so. Now you are now going to try and get a lighter deal for your client. You will now discuss with your client that, okay, when you expose your client in that way to the state, you are hoping that, they can be, the information you are giving to them will be useful for them to catch the real robbers, but also you are trying to get a lighter sentence for your client. That is how it works. Then you will enter into some negotiations with the state, considering the charge that they had initially charged him with. And if you are, com you are, you are going to request that there be some changes made to the charge so that he doesn't plead to robbery. Instead, you should maybe plead to being in possession of stolen properties, only if obviously the state will accept. I'll come to that. You'll see how it works. So I hope it's, it's clear for you. You'll see. Don't worry too much. I think uh, as we go along, some of the things will may become more and more clear. But yes, if your client is pleading guilty, 
obviously you're not just going to take the charge as it stands. You will try and see if you can get the lighter sentence for them because that is why you are there. You are, you are there to act in the best interest of your client. So their client is a lay person before the court. You are the one who knows the law. Then you are supposed to try and get the better bargain for your client. That's how it works. So you will negotiate with the state. Okay. All right. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, Elsie. Uh, no, I wanted to add for the sake of everyone else where you said there are a variety of legislations where you would find that certain crimes are committed. And obviously there are penalties and offenses in mm. that specific legislation. So mm. I wanted to say, for an example, I am um, enforcing environmental crimes mm -hmm. where there are a whole lot of environmental legislations mm. where in the legislation the crimes have been stipulated to say, for an example, if you are illegally commencing with a certain listed activity, which mm. requires, for example, a permit, a yeah, authorizations yeah. and mm. so forth, then mm -hmm. therefore you commit a crime. And mm. as such, the penalty penalties and offenses will be applicable. So mm -hmm. each and every legislation, depending with um, uh, uh, the regulatory framework within the country, or mm -hmm. even maybe international, there yes. will be those yes uh, acts of crimes mm -hmm. which are stipulated to say if you are committing this crime, therefore the penalty and offenses is the following. So mm -hmm. it depends in, in each and every sector because we have got many, many sectors and many, many legislation. So I just wanted to add on that, that we are not only limited in terms of the statutes that you have identified here, but somebody within the uh, labor law can be contravening the occupational health and safety Safety Act mm -hmm. laws, and there will be crimes, crimes and penalties on offenses which are applicable to that. So there is a whole lot of things. True. So thanks, thanks. True, true. Very. Thank you so much for that. Yes. So like I say here, the legislature when they make up these pieces of legislation or the laws, is to respond to the events that are affecting our communities. Something that was not even a crime can exist out of a creation of a new legislation. I'll give you an example. Where there is an increase of uh, gender-based violence, in the past, people just thought that if you beat up somebody, it's assault. But because of the scourge of this type of gender-related offenses, the legislature was called upon now to look into creating a specific legislation that will address the assaults or whatever conducts that are happening between the genders. I'm talking here about your Domestic Violence Act, your Children's Act, and any other uh, laws that are there to help our community to be more tolerant to what's each other. For instance, with members of the the term has been uh, prolonged, guys. Please forgive me uh, with my LGBTQ. I, I know that there's other, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know, there's other uh, community members that are added there, but basically it's not just gays and lesbians and uh, transgenders, you name it. The community as of the LGBTQ and, 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 and. It's been a common thing within most of our communities that they were being targeted and they were being oh. abused, you know, for merely being who they are. So when this happens, <clears throat> sensitivity needs to come into the play whereby when it's, a, you know, someone who appears before court and it's two people who have engaged in a fight, the court will just take it that, okay, it's a fight, then the court will consider the elements of the crime uh, allegedly committed me. So with the LGBT, if this, sorry, sorry guys, the phone is ringing here. Now, sorry, sorry, guys. So when they find that 
this person was not just assaulted for being who they are, but there was some prejudice that has led to the perpetration of this offense for them being uh, members of the gays and lesbians. We know about the albinos also being uh, targeted. The courts, they are very, you know, cautious when dealing with that, though there is no specific uh, legislation, but I, I can foresee that there may be something that will come up because we know of people who've just been killed. And when you ask, they will just say no because they were gay or they were lesbian, you know. So the legislature obviously adds out to address all these common issues that are affecting our communities. Okay. Common law is our next source. It is based out of the English law and it still finds application in our criminal law today. The principles of law of, of evidence is what we use in our courts when we present evidence in court. And those principles are founded out of the English law. For instance, when we are dealing with things like whether a piece of evidence should be accepted or should be admissible to the court or it's going to be inadmissible, we use the principles of law of evidence. So please, it's an old source to consult, but very, very, very important because in South Africa, you cannot uh, present evidence without visiting those principles in order to see that the manner that you are presenting your evidence is in line with the law of evidence. If you deviate, here I'm talking about, for instance, your hearsay evidence, we know that it's generally uh, inadmissible because if you come to court, you are giving evidence, we want you to have been a witness to what you are talking about. But the law of evidence gives us exceptions, for example, to say in that kind of a situation, these are the exceptions where the court may accept hearsay evidence. So you see where now you will then have to go and visit uh, the law of evidence to check how do I get this hearsay evidence to be accepted by the court? even though the general principles are that hearsay evidence is not admissible in court. So it, 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 it just works like a hand and a glove. So it is what it is. If you want to use alibis, for example, you will visit the evidence, law of evidence and see how do you present an evidence, uh, an evidence of an alibi to prove your, your case to the court. So, that's uh, what I want to say there. Textbooks, articles, and journals. These are based out of academic authors like what you used, uh, I think it's what you still use in university, mm -hmm. the Sneiman textbook uh, on criminal law and your many other sources uh, on criminal procedures, uh, your law journals like your De Ribas, because on those uh, sources, that is where you are going to find, uh, for instance, in the journals, you find someone who's a practitioner in that field and they are seasoned in their practice. They have a, a done a lot of research and they've actually dealt with that type of an, a, an, an, a, an issue and they may want to write an opinion piece, just an opinion. And you may find that the manner in which they have written their opinion piece on, uh, say, for example, on the Deribas, you can see the presentation that this person has done a lot of research and they've applied, you know, the law as it stands. And you can see that this is an opinion by someone who also comes with great authority on the subject based on their knowledge, their day-to-day -day practice 
of the, uh, the, the subject matter, then you may feel that on a case that you have, it may be anything, not just even only the ribas. It can even be, for instance, a, an engineering journal or a medical journal. When you find that, or it may be something related to IT, the manner in which this uh, uh, article has been compiled, it's so you know good that you can actually use it as a reference point in your case. So that is why we say lawyers, they read, and you don't just read only the law books. You don't just read, I mean, nowadays people, they read social media articles, whatever posts, you know, but lawyers are supposed to be readers because you're supposed to always be doing research so that, you know, should a client walk into your office, you know, because of the nature of our work, we share knowledge as colleagues. If, it, uh, you know, someone comes and says, you know what, I'm, I'm having a situation like this, you may remember that eh, the other day I was reading an article on estates, you know, like properties. And, you know, the manner in which that article was presented, it's going to be useful and it will help you in your case. So that's the point that I'm making with uh, the, the journals. So it doesn't have to be someone who comes with academic a background like a professor or it can be someone who's just on the field but very knowledgeable on the topic and i tell you such people because of the uh, amount of knowledge that they may have on the subject matter you may actually consider even using them as a witness in your case because Yes, we are lawyers. Obviously, we don't know everything. We try to make ourselves to have a broad general knowledge, but there are things that are more, you know, in-depth and technical, and it may not be in our field. So if you find someone who is that much knowledgeable, you may then consider <laughs> using them as a witness. I'm talking here, for instance, about something like DNA. We are not uh, like experts in that field. We can read up all we want to, but there are very technical things that you may consider maybe using that author of that article to be giving an opinion in your case based on what uh, they have uh, as knowledge on the subject matter. So when you are reading, Always read with an open mind and see how that can be uh, useful. So I'm closing the chapter of uh, the sources. I want to move on to the next item. Uh, do we have any questions, comments before we move to the next slide? Did you have to go? Madam, please mute yourself. Who is that? I can't even see. All right. So the next uh, slide is about the people who are participants in a criminal case. We've already talked a lot about the accused. Sorry. Yo, what did I do now? Okay. Talked a lot about... Uh, the accused, please don't forget them as we are going along because they are the most obvious because they are the reasons why we are going to be in court. So also please on this uh, chapter, uh, please, uh, I may talk from a defense lawyer point of view because that is my experience. But if you would like to hear, for instance, how would the state handle that kind of an issue, you are welcome to just bring it up. 
but I will try to be as neutral as I possibly can whenever I remember to give you that uh, insight as well on how the state would approach it. But generally, because of my experience, I would be more on the side of uh, the defense. So the first one is the police, that is the, the law enforcement agencies. These are the people who are having a duty to maintain law and order, prevent crime, prevent crime, investigate reports of crime. I don't know, someone saying the link is not working, but they are typing here. I don't know. With regards to the links, I can't help. Uh, I'm hoping uh, because ma'am, they're talking about something else. They're trying to um, create. So sorry, um, Ms. Okay. Yes. yes. No, they're talking about something else. They're creating a WhatsApp group for the. So this is our first session. So we're trying to create a WhatsApp group on the side, and that's what they're referring to. So oh, okay. Continue. Because I was I was wondering why they're saying the link is not working, but they're here. But anyway, I wanted to say all those link issues should be addressed with Zukiso. Anyway, um, now uh, the next point of discussion should be, hey, this is becoming disruptive now, hey? Um, uh, who is a police officer? This is a very contentious uh, issue, ladies and gentlemen, because when we say police officer, everyone assumes that we are talking about one person. And uh, in terms of our law in South Africa, the law recognizes what is called a peace officer. Uh, I think that was the first guy who spoke Maybe he can enlighten us for the sake of progress to just please tell us who is a peace officer. If they are still with us, I'm hoping. And here there's no right and wrong answers. Who do you think is a peace officer? Any takers? Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm listening. Yes. I think a yes, I think a peace officer we are basically referring to police officers, the correctional services, and the metro officers. I'm not sure if I'm correct. So when you say police officer, you mean SAPS, South African police. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. Can, can I can yes, I maybe yes. try? Can I can I um, I, would think, I, I would think, uh, if I can maybe, I would think that SAPS would Let's fall have under police officer. Um, SAPS would fall under police officer, but yes. a police officer refers to law enforcement that's appointed at the municipal level, for example, your CPF, your JMPD, so they do not fall under the South African Police Service, but appointed under municipal law. I yes. might stand to be corrected. Yes. Okay. So I but had a, a, a gentleman also wanted to speak there. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, I, I wanted to add something because I think uh, a police, as they, they always differentiate a police officer and a peace officer. I think it's because of their ranking. A peace officer is uh, it's, it's like a captain in the police station, the one who has powers to get. Uh, a uh, warrant of arrest of a of a person or to search the property of the person. Okay, the lady. In my view, I, I would assume that a peace officer would be anyone who's been given authority to maintain law and order. Okay. By someone, him. someone in the comments also says a civil officer appointed to preserve the law. Yes. Uh, mute, please. Uh, there's a background noise. Can you mute when you finished speaking? So the reason why I ask specifically on uh, this title of a peace officer, okay. we are having a, a terrible background noise now. Okay. 
the reason why I ask on who is a, a peace officer, it's because this peace officer, as per my slide there, they have a power to arrest, search, and conduct a seizure, to seize items that are related to a commission of a crime. So the way it is, I think it will show you that it cannot be everyone. It means that it's some particular group of officers who are considered as peace officers. Now, you want to take one more? If you, before I, I, I now give my own, Yes. One more person. Ah. Yes. It's a peace officer, not someone appointed in terms of Section 3341 of the Criminal Procedure Act. A police officer being a, a bona fide peace officer, but then you get also magistrates, judges, and so forth also being appointed in terms of that by implication. So we are adding to that to that police officer, we are adding magistrates and judges. Hello? Yes? The military police. Military police, they can be the peace officer. They deal with the... the are you saying military police? police? Your line is not very clear, but I think I hear you saying military police. Yes, but soldiers, I mean military police, those police who, who, who are within the military. Okay. Also okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. So, all right. Yes, I'm glad that it shows that people can see that this is not just an ordinary police officer. That's why you are trying to think who else can be added on this. But in our law, as it stands, and this has been a very contentious issue. I mean, cases have been brought to court to that to try and challenge that title of peace officer and as it stands no one has managed to get this definition to be extended so in our law the only people who are peace officer is the members of the south african police office south african police subs and South African Defense Force. Those are the only recognized officer who are given this title of a peace officer. Only these two are having the right or rather the power to make an arrest, to search you and to conduct a seizure. Now this becomes a challenge, like I've told you, a lot of cases have been brought to court to try and expand this peace officer title to cover other officers because in the metros we have, you know, law enforcement agency called Metro Police. We have traffic officers who belong to the Department of Transport who also engage in law enforcement activities. We have the security officers, your security guards, who also are working hand in um, hand. Ms. With... Ms. Sebe, can I please come in? Yes. Can I please ask a question? Yes. But on page 17 of the training guide that we provided by the school, right? Yes. Page 17, paragraph 2. Mm. It kind of contradicts what you just said because it mm. then says that um, by virtue of section 334, other officials such as traffic officers, metro police, and game wardens are also regarded as peace officers, which means they may also exercise some of the powers granted to police officials. I'm glad you are reading your guide. I'm still coming there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the definition as it stands, it's South African police and the military. Now, 
I was explaining that these other officers are also doing law enforcement activities like your game rangers, like who, uh, the Metro Police. We see them stopping, arresting, whatever we think is arrest, you know. So now, legally speaking, and me, I'm only going to tell you what will stand in court as evidence and what cannot stand. Right. Your book. I think where they, I get that question a lot because it's the way the guide has been formulated. It leaves a gap because it doesn't explain to you that the power of arrest can be extended by, for instance, you know that police, uh, metro police, they conduct uh, roadblocks. So they will be given an authority that at that uh, roadblock, if they find something that is uh, happening or someone who is, you know, for instance, with weapons or whatever, they may conduct searches and also undertake arresting activities. And also with our security guards, they are in the malls. We see them every day when people are going out of the shop. We see them that if someone is stealing something in the shop, they're the ones who normally stop them. They will find those items on the person and they will be the ones who will, you understand, get the person to be ending up appearing in court. But the legal definition, that is what I said, it has not been changed, but the right or the power to arrest can be extended by a special authority. And it will be specified in writing that today, these officers, depending on who they are, this is the activity that they are going to undertake, and this is what they are looking for. And if anyone is found to be in possession or under, undertaking in such activities that would be considered to be of criminality, then they will be entitled to act on that Day. It's not an everyday type of a thing. Let me help you also to see it clearly. With your Metro Police officers, they are there to enforce the, uh, the municipal bylaws and also to ensure that we are, uh, all of us as uh, drivers, you know, abiding by the rules of the road and all that. So when they stop you on the road, by law, generally, as they just conduct your random stops and search, that's what they called. But please be careful. I'm talking to lawyers here. I'm not talking to lay people. So I will not address you as lay people. I'm considering you that you will see what I'm trying to show you. This is how cases get thrown out in court. Because if a metro officer approaches you, they have to have that written authority that I've told you that will give them that power to make an arrest, to search and to seize. If they don't have that written authority and it, the circumstances must be fully stated out on that authority for what they are allowed to do and why and what is the operation that they are conducting. Now, if they find themselves where they are, say uh, just a random, these random ones on the street, Hold on for me, sorry. Someone is at the door. To those who are raising their hands, um, we were if told. I can't see them. I'm not there. Yeah, sorry. I, I did say I can't no, I see the, the hands. So if it's just those randoms, as uh, uh, stop and search, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So now, those officers, what are they allowed to do? They are obviously allowed to ask you for your driver's license. They are allowed to check that your car license is valid. But I'm saying to you, they are not allowed to search yourself and your car. Because they can only do so when they have a written authority 
to do so. So if they ask you, because generally people, they assume because he's wearing a uniform, I must submit. This is an officer of the law. If you submit yourself to that search and seizure, you cannot come back and complain that you were abused because you surrendered your rights. That is why I'm telling you about this. If a client comes and tells you this is the, the manner in which I was arrested, you have to find out what was actually the position and what was happening there. If it was those random stop and search, there's been a lot of cases, ladies and gentlemen, on so many that are getting thrown out on the basis of exactly that. Elsie, um, Lizette, sorry to interject. Um, so can I just ask on that um, written authority, that document or that permit that gives them authorization to, to do that deed at this, that specific day, it should also contain that um, it gives them the power to be at that specific place. So if you in see the road in Santon, it should state that on that um, document. Yes, thank you for that. The written authority will say, today being the 6th of February, 2023, at corner of Malibongwe and whatever, I don't know the roads, you know, uh, Malibongwe and William Nicole. I'm just uh, making an example. From 7 p.m. to midnight or from 7 p.m. to 11, the time will be specified. This is the activities that will be undertaken there. We will randomly stop cars that are passing there and this is what we are looking for. And anything that is obviously suspected to be connected to commission of a crime will be seized. And most important, those roadblocks, there must be a very senior officer. It cannot just be your, I don't know what is their ranks in the metro, but it cannot be like your most junior or only being there. They must have one of their most high ranking officer, like a chief, mm -hmm. must be present when they are undertaking that operation. And if they find that someone uh, is obviously maybe an unlicensed firearm, for an example, because when they meet you, they, they ask to search your car because they are given that authority and they find a firearm, they ask you, okay, where's your license? No license produced. Then they are going to do their job. They are going to place you under arrest. And uh, no, normally those uh, operations, subs will be present. So they will hand you over. To South African police who will then further read your rights and then they will take you to a uh, holding cells because Metro Police don't have holding cells. Merci, B. Hello. Yes. Yes. May I please ask a question? Yes. I see that you are saying that these people must have special authority to mm -hmm. undertake the duties of officers who are able to arrest. Mm -hmm. That piece of paper that's giving them the authority. Mm. How do we know whether or not that piece of paper is real? You I must... mean, anyone can just formulate it and say, Bona, I have this piece of paper, I want to search your car. How do you know whether or not that piece of paper is authentic? I don't, I don't know of situations where they have gambled like that. If maybe you are still doubting the paper, then ask to see the most senior <sighs> officer in charge. Um, I think, Elsie, if I may also come in there, mm. uh, in some instances, for an example, I'm also a, a peace officer, ex-officio. Mm -hmm. So we, we we go everywhere with our identification card for the designation mm -hmm. by the minister in terms of the legislation. Mm -hmm. And we also go with the handbook, the, the, the powers and the functions yeah. that we have been given. For an example, there will be those who are doing criminal investigation investigation, if maybe they're going to do the search and seizure, obviously they apply for the warrant uh, to yes. search and seizure and all those things. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the powers and functions, there, there are those ones, like for example, in my application of work, there is a section which says at any time an inspector can enter and investigate and seize and, and do all those things in terms of their power. And then that, that the powers and functions obviously is supported by the 
the identification card, which will say, OK, I, my name uh, has been uh, designated in terms of the following to enforce the following. And then therefore, whoever wants to identify, maybe to get clarification can say they always say, OK, can I see where do you have the powers to enter at any time? Then we show them the powers in terms of our designation for the environmental management inspectors. And when maybe they are still not sure, then they will phone or contact the, 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 the highest authority within the department. So uh, the, 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 the written authority might not necessarily to say maybe during today uh, between 9 and 10, there will be an operation where the police and whoever will be searching, but there will be those whole range of powers and functions, each and every official maybe within their designated uh, mandate, they are, uh, are authorized to undertake certain activities. But in terms of the arresting, as you have uh, explained, whenever maybe um, uh, there is a situation where certain uh, people have to be arrested. Yes, in, 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 in uh, we secure the, the South African Police Service who will come and arrest those people, even if we have uh, read their rights. But there will be the SAPS who will come and arrest those people and take them to police station for further uh, 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 whatever uh, 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 functions that they're going, tasks that they're going to do there. But uh, the authority is we normally have the identification card where it will explain the mandate and the powers and the designation and everything supported by the handbook that we always carry around whenever there are questions uh, asked about but why do you why do you uh, maybe enter and, and search and do all those things and and normally it's when there is a reasonable suspicion because sometimes you go and do the inspection and you find that there is something that is criminal activities have been undertaken there. And from that moment when they have been warned, that's when they exercise also the powers to search and seizure and everything. But I was just trying to clarify that uh, normally it's it might not be, it be a written document uh, that maybe you obtained yesterday, for an example, your warrant, uh, but it might also be an identification card, depending on whatever piece of legislation you've been designated in terms of. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, may I come in? Yes. I am. Um... I'm a bit perplexed, ma'am. I've, I've, I've been listening. I'm at work and uh, I'm a, a, a metropolis officer. Mm. Uh, and I've heard uh, some of the things you say. Mm. And uh, I, 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 if I a little bit uh, with my experience, and uh, I've been here 15 years. So what I know is that metropolis officers are appointed in terms of an SAPS Act, if I'm not mistaken, is Section 64. Mm. We are empowered. Uh, to do crime prevention, bylaws, and uh, uh, the dead one sleeps me. The only uh, powers we don't have is detective powers. Uh, that's all. We can't investigate. We, we, we don't investigate in terms of um, detectives uh, as the SAPS have. So after the certificate, that uh, states that mm -hmm. I, am, 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 I am a peace officer. Uh, signed by the uh, premier of uh, my province. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm a bit perplexed because on a daily basis, we stop and search vehicles. Mm. Uh, in terms of the powers the SAPS has been given, uh, I've been to court. Uh, what usually happens is that uh, the, either the prosecutor or the defendant's lawyer or the magistrate will ask you where where do you get the powers, where did you get the powers to execute whatever you did, and you inform that in terms of uh, section. Uh, I think it's if I'm not mistaken, it's 64 with the SAPS Act. I am empowered to, to do this, this and that, uh, and I've had convic uh, con um, convictions based on those. Uh, uh, power. So uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit perplexed. Please uh, maybe enlighten me a, a, a bit more on this point. Uh, maybe before um, Elsie can enlighten. Oh, yeah. sorry. I wanted to say, Elsie, when you are expanding more, can you also make make reference maybe to Section 334 of the Criminal Procedure Act? 
because mm -hmm. that's where it's stipulating that several mm -hmm. other officials and mention a few of them, they are, they also have those powers and then they are uh, peace officers. Maybe just in specific of um, section uh, 334 of the Criminal Procedure Act, that is on page 17 of the guide. So maybe we can uh, understand where do they inter um, uh, lap each other. Thanks. Okay. Um, Ms. Elsie, before you can expand, can I just maybe confirm my understanding because I'm now getting confused. Mm -hmm. From what I understood, you said that there's a definition in terms of law of what a police officer is. Please. And that specifically Please. refers to SAPS and SANDF. Yes. But in addition to that definition, in terms of the written, I'm not sure what you called it, that certain other people, in mm -hmm. this case your JMPD, and, and can also be granted the the, the same powers to arrest, search, and seizure. But yes. then those powers will then be granted by written authority. Like the yes. gentleman that was speaking now, that he has that written authority that says, because the Metro Police officer, these are the powers granted to him. So if yes. you do not have that written authority, then you cannot perform those functions. But if you have it, you can perform it. And what I further understood is that if it's a random stop and search, then they must have that document that says today they're entitled to do one, two, three, four. But if they don't have it or you don't ask and subject yourself to the search and then you waive your right to then demand that, no, because you searched me without having this, you cannot say this. If you subject yourself to the search and then you are allowing them to do that. Unless, of course, if you say, can I see this document? And if they don't have it, then they can't proceed with the search. Or um, did I miss something there? You got Sorry, me 100%. Pardon. 100%. Hello, Mama. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I come in there? That's right. exactly what I said, that by definition, that is why all these cases have been brought by people that we as ordinary people would think they are police officers because we would assume that they can have the same powers. And I did say that the powers can be extended and I've tried to give you those instances. So if you are in the job on a daily, you know what documents that you get given to be able to do whatever type of work. But I'm telling you, uh, I'm referring here to our lady who is with environmental uh, policing and also with uh, our metro. I'm telling you, if you are in a sleeping court, because we have sleeping courts, you know, it's not going to be put okay. on me that I must come and give you information which is wrong. Because if you go to courts, courts, they are courts who probe and they will question your authority. As you say, as a metro officer, I've been given this authority in terms of this, and it says that I can do this. You will meet a presiding officer who will question it, and you will have to show the court that you were within your rights to have conducted yourself on that day in that particular way. And I'm not saying a metro officer, because the question often comes, what are they supposed to do? If it's a security or if it's metro police, there is a robbery that is happening in place. Are they supposed to fold their hands and watch, stand by and say, no, we are not uh, peace officers, we can't do? No, they are there for a, a law enforcement. They are there to, to do crime prevention. So by expansion of these rights, they cannot stand by and watch. They can accost the perpetrators. You can listen to me when I speak. My words are very careful. And maybe that will also help you, uh, our uh, colleague Metro Police, when you go to court. Should you not meet uh, someone from this class, when they are asking you, what did you do on that day? It depends on the situation. You can accost a, a suspect or someone who's doing something of a criminal uh, element. You accost them and then you take them into a space where you, if you are questioning, say, for example, you are a security officer, where you will now have to read out the rights and whatever. At least the Metro Police have been trained with that. But your security guards, they don't even know which rights exactly must be read. And I'm not even sure about fully about the Metro Police, whether they know all the rights that have to be read out to a suspect. Because I did say, if there's an issue about those rights, people get found to be in possession of illegal things or to have committed crimes. But because of this is a technicality, that is what we call it in law, 
that will be used by the lawyers who will come and say, yes, fine, we can see it. It's a real firearm, it's been tested, the ballistic report is here. But the That's manner true. of you seizing this item becomes a question. So what I'm saying to you is don't just assume that everyone who's wearing uniform is going to be having all the rights because each case must be checked thoroughly. That is what I'm saying. I, I think, yes. excuse me, Mama, yes. can I ask a question yes. in relation to section 22 of the CPA? I was still coming to it. It is actually on the slide here, but come, yes, let's hear you. Yes, ma'am. We have situations okay. where Please, we no, have situations no. where police no, officers. I did hear you. You mentioned. Please. But there's two people talking. Yes. Can I talk? You have a third one? Can you wait for the gentleman who started first? Let's hear you. Okay, ma'am. It's in relation okay. to section 22 of the CPA. Yes. Uh, we have situations where police officers who accost people on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the person is unwilling to submit to being searched, mm -hmm. you know, and the police use their intimidatory tactics to get the person to submit to this very search. And maybe in the mm -hmm. course of the person being searched and something now has been found. And what is the situation if maybe the person is taken to court and the situation of this uh, search has been explained to a a, a legal practitioner or, or in this situation, a defense uh, practitioner, how is it going to be handled in court? When you say police officer, you mean SAPS? Yes. South African police officer. The situation with SAPS is obvious. There, we don't have an issue with that because they are automatically granted that power to arrest, to commit searches, and to seize items they can do so with a warrant and without a warrant that we know so i don't know if maybe i'm answering you yes uh, but uh, no. uh, oh. the, 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 the situation will depend where you say maybe they acted without a warrant then you'll have to justify why they didn't get a warrant first and they will exactly. give reasons why they didn't Exactly, where they didn't have That's a warrant to search a person and the person did not consent to this very search. Okay, I'll come to that in my next slide. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll answer you there. Yes? Uh, yes, yes yeah, I, can I read for us the very, distinction of the police officer Vepati? Sorry? Hello. Yes, I, I, can I read I, I the definition the, of the police officer Hello? Vepati? Two people are talking. No, I'm talking first. Yes, finish. Let him talk again. But wait. I want to. I, I want to read the definition of a peace officer. A uh, vapor team. Now it is just lost for me here. But it says peace officer includes any magistrate, justice police official, correctional officials as defined in section one of their correctional services. You see, they are, no, they are not safety, I mean, a, a South African defense force there. And also those people, and in relation to any area offense, in class of offense or power, referred, referred to in a notice issued under section 3341, any person who is a peace officer under that section. Okay, I think there, what you are missing is that right now, we are talking about who is a police officer, because these are the people who are having these powers to arrest search and seizure. So I'm, I'm specific. No, this is where I am. I'm talking about their powers to arrest to seize and to search. So I don't know if you are expanding it to that extent. It may even even include a marriage officer <laughs> from what you are talking no, about. No. I, I'm looking for <laughs> you. Understand? Because here we are talking about the day-to-day -day, uh, activities of police officer. That is why we are having this whole discussion. 
Uh, sorry, I was thinking um, that we are still at police officers. I was not knowing that now you are at police officers. We are discussing who is a police officer. Ma not a police officer. Has a question? Yes. Uh, my question is, law in, does it differ? Do we have a, can we differentiate or is it one and the same thing between law enforcement officer and a peace officer? Is it one and the same thing or are we interpreting them differently? No, the activities intertwine because a police officer is also doing law enforcement duties and a law enforcement officer in terms of the agencies is also undertaking crime prevention, maintenance of law. It's just that, like our Metro has already stated, they don't investigate. So that is why under this topic of the participants, I discuss both of them because they do the policing, per se. Whether it's animal uh, protection or human beings protection against crime, but they are doing policing. So we were talking about policing right now. I hope that clarifies. Okay, so okay, maybe we should continue. And then maybe when we get to some examples of uh, how these powers are exercised, it will also help us to have more clarity to see why I say, and I will try and get you tomorrow. I, I, I hate doing that because I've been given a guy, a program that I need to follow when I present the course. I try not to overfeed you with information because some of these things, I'm glad that some of you are reading uh, your manuals, but you are expected to read on the case law. I'm telling you, there's lots of cases. Just go into your law reports, type cases relating to who is a peace officer. You will see a whole list of cases where the courts have tried to give expansion to this term and to, to you know, especially the, the members of the security cluster, the security yeah. guards are the ones who've been uh, mostly uh, 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 trying to get also to be like Metro Police to be given more powers, you understand? See how the courts interpret these uh, terms and see how the courts, uh, you know, are applying their mind to this type of situation. Sorry, I'm... Hello? Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes. 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 When you're dealing with people, I just want to, to, to get a dead person that you, yet, that you mentioned. You mentioned SAPS members, SAMPS members. I, I, I can't remember the third one. The ones who, that I said cannot be challenged. Has, There's no issue to debate about who they are as police officers. It's South African police and the South African army. Defense, defense yeah, force. Those two. those two, we don't have an issue. But when it comes to the other law enforcement agencies, then the expansion of rights, what, how far they can go, what they can do and what they can do. That is where there's normally issues of contention in the courts when the evidence is being brought to court by them. That is what I'm trying to show you here. That's fine. I didn't understand very well. And then if you now, okay, okay. Can you also invoke on it like in section 35, that's okay, the, the, those people, they were not authorized to uh, search and do uh, or, or arrest on a city. As a... Ladies and gentlemen, your line is not very clear. I, I'm sure everyone else can agree with me that we can hear you nicely. But please, the point of what I'm trying to tell you, Ne. So I think like you can use it. Thanks. The point to last is where we can't hear you. Okay. We can't hear him nicely. Hear what but, you're but what I'm trying to say to you, whether you agree with LC or not, go on and you will see it. Do your own research, read up. You will see there's lots of cases where evidence presented by these other law enforcement agencies was challenged successfully and it was thrown out because of 
those technical, I said, these are technicalities. And I even said, the ones who generally are standing, you know, without question, it's these two, South African police and the army. When the evidence is brought by the other law enforcement agencies, then, you know, more scrutiny comes into the fore. And we try to check more clearly whether their authority has also expanded to them having done what they had done to make sure that they were authorized fully to have done what they did and they can come with authority to present that type of question. evidence just so like other officers. Um, Ms. Elsie, can I ask in terms of time, we've done nine slides in, an, in, in two hours. We've got 25 slides to go. On this point alone, we've spent over half an hour Will we be able to finish all of this? And if not, what then is the plan? Because at this rate, there is no way we'll go through the entire training guide in five days. We will get to the end, madam. I give it, maybe people like they said they are quite perplexed. And you know, you get perplexed when maybe you haven't personally dealt with it. Me, I don't get perplexed because I've seen these things yes. actually playing out in practice. But it doesn't mean if it hasn't come to your attention that it doesn't exist. So I'm trying to prepare you so that when you meet it, you will know how to handle it. Or at least it won't come as a shock and a surprise that you will feel that someone is insulting your authority or questioning you so that you know that these things happen every day in court, in some courts. Let me rather say. So let's move along, guys. Uh, and... Ma'am, just to intervene. Uh, Ma'am, just to intervene. Uh, maybe I turn to second the lady who suggested when we started that we should reserve questions to at the end of each uh, maybe slide or at the end of the lecture. Maybe give it uh, like few minutes for questions because in my experience, if we do an open up session whereby anyone will jump in and ask question. We end up having an argument, sort of a lecture, not but not an actual lecture. As she said, we have more slides to complete, and we're not only left with an hour. We only have done nine slides, you know. Okay, so I can accommodate after every slide before I move to the next slide. Okay, so also, can I also make a request on my side that we try and not go back and forth once the point I have made, you can raise your disagreement with me, but remember, I'm LC. If you feel that you can find an authority that can back you up, you can go and research it and bring it to us. You are welcome to say, LC, on the topic that we were talking about, this is what I actually found, but it's nothing personal. We are just proceeding along and me, I'm just giving you what is, is happening in practice. And these are the things that are out there, like I said. So let's just try not to be making a back and forth. And yes, can we not speak on top of each other? When the one is talking, please give one a chance and then we proceed like that. Thank you. But we will we will get to our slides, uh, colleagues, please. So, prosecuting authority is the next one, uh, the next participant in uh, criminal um, proceedings. This is who we call dominus litis because they bear the power to make decisions on whether to prosecute matters or not. So it's an absolute authority that they have. No court can impose on them. And even whatever authority you as the defense lawyer can bring to them will not force them. You should be mindful of my words. Cannot force them to prosecute or not to prosecute. So it is entirely up to them. Of course, you are entitled to make what we call representations to them, for them to consider maybe a withdrawal of the case or whatever suggestion that you want to make concerning the case. But it is what? Only a suggestion. The ultimate decision rests with them. Now, in practice, there is a common trend that 
is uh, and I'm glad that we have officers here uh, whereby you find that people will be first arrested and then investigations take place later. This becomes a challenge because when we spoke earlier, we spoke about the rights that come into play immediately when a person is arrested, right? And if there's any issue, now we end up with the state being sued for cases where there was unlawful arrests, unlawful uh, detentions. So, and also it becomes a challenge in that there is a, obviously a disruption that happens in a person's life when you are arrested. Now, whether you agree with me or not, the idea is, this is the idea that when a case is brought to court, in practice, the police will be approached by someone who comes to lay a charge or complain of whatever crime. And at that stage, they will pick up whatever information that they can uh, gather at that stage. And then they will now take that case to the office of the prosecutors to say, we believe that we have a case that can be prosecuted. We're asking for you to give your authority for us to proceed and you prosecute the case in court. Now, that is where a decision will be taken to either proceed with the prosecution of the matter or they will now do what is called a nolly prosecuty where if they feel that at that stage they are not going to proceed due to insufficient evidence that is contained in the case or there's just not enough evidence that they have. That is how things are supposed to play out in under normal circumstances. But the majority of the cases that are before court, you will see when a person comes uh, for what is called a first appearance in court, the first thing the court will ask the prosecutor, what is the charge? And they will mention what is the charge and briefly, the prosecutor will tell the court what are the allegations that are being made against this accused person. Now comes the part where the court will deal with the issues of release, whether to release on bail or warning or a, on a, what is called a free bail. After the court has entertained that, before the matter can be postponed, the court will ask the state, has the state concluded their investigations? 98% of the cases that are coming on these first appearances, their investigations are not yet complete. Is it by the fault of the state or the police? No, sometimes. But in my experience, I have found that unless if it's a case where the police uh, foreseeing a situation that maybe they may lose the evidence or the person may flee before they can actually do an arrest. I don't think that much thought is put on this issue that ideally cases that come before court, they should be brought at least with the investigations being complete. I'm bringing this issue because every accused person agree with me or you don't agree. Me, I'm a defense lawyer, guys. I will not defend myself. Every accused person that comes before court is presumed, presumed innocent until proven guilty. So if you bring person and you subject them to
Okay, so if they present a case before the magistrate, in an ideal world, we would like a situation where they have at least wrapped up their investigations. But I'm telling you, in a huge majority of these cases, they just come there and they say investigations are not complete. And this is where now we get to the next uh, situation whereby we will find that these lawsuits, they continue against the state and a great majority of them, they are actually successful because of exactly what I'm saying here. You've disrupted a person's life, you know, and now at the last minute you come to court and after they have appeared, they've actually spent time in custody and everybody knew that this person is arrested and then just out of the blue, months, sometimes even years later, you just stand up as a prosecutor in court and you say, we have taken a decision to withdraw the case due to lack of evidence. So that is my point that I'm making to you, that uh, you as the lawyer, you need to guard for these kind of situations because if you are going to join <clears throat> what is happening in practice without applying your mind and I told you, you act in the best interest of your client. And when you are there, you are there to ensure that the rights of your client are protected and you eliminate any unnecessary prejudice that can come about. It is upon you to act timelessly to ensure that you don't even have to end up with this uh, cases of uh, lawsuits against the state and all that. I want to move to the next slide, honorables. Can I proceed or do we have questions? We can proceed. Let's proceed. Let's proceed. Okay. Proceed. Now, Please proceed. we have, thank you. We have state witnesses as the next participant. And the, the, the general um, principle is that as a defense lawyer, you are not allowed to consult with state witnesses unless with the, the decision or the permission of the DPP or the prosecutor. Now, you should always, prosecutor should always be present when you happen to talk to their witness. And this is to ensure that you avoid a situation where you will be said to have influenced state witnesses not to testify against the accused or to have interfered in any way with the state case. So state witnesses are the people who normally would give statements on behalf of the state. And if the state has obtained such a witness statements from them, we automatically consider that they are going to be testifying for the state. Unless if the state can pronounce that they will not be using that witness, then you can ask for them to be availed for you to consult with them or to use them as your own witness. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I proceed. Do we have questions there? Yeah, um, one question. Yes, uh, yeah. Okay. No, just, a, uh, just a general question. Yes. Yeah, uh, for a state witness, I'm asking you uh, uh, just to support myself because I'm in that predicament. Uh, who supports the state witness when it comes to issues, matters like tra traveling? Because automatically being a state witness, it means you are working for a state. You are helping a state to prosecute the accused. So who is responsible for 
uh, the witness to travel to court and so on in case the case is being prolonged. I've been attending a court case for more than three times, which was postponed, and I'm traveling far from home to the court. So I have, do I have a right to say, after the matter has been resolved, to say, you guys have been asking me to come to the court 10 times. Will you please reimburse me? Please help me on that. So when you are a state witness, you would have been given what is called a subpoena for the first time when you will be coming to court. So that is like a notice to inform you that on this particular day, you are required to show in a particular court as a state witness. Normally, that, that Sabina is what you will give to the prosecutor in court on that day when they are postponing the case to say, <clears throat> here's my address on the Sabina. See how far I have traveled to come here. And please, can I be reinvest for traveling purposes? So they do provide for their state witnesses to be reinvest for their traveling. They also give letters for you if maybe you are working, you need to present that to your employer to say this person was called to be a witness in court. This is the reason that you were absent in court. Now, if the matter is postponed, you are going to be told by the court, by the magistrate, that Mr. So-and-so, this matter is postponed to the future date, and you are going to be required that you be present on the next occasion when this matter comes to court. Now there's no subpoena. So, if you say you've been there three times, I expect that at least the last two times you were at court, you didn't have a subpoena. But you had a subpoena at least on the first occasion that you were there. And also your address, I'm expecting it would show on your statement to the prosecutor because sometimes they change in court. You can even ask them to check on your statement that this is the address where you are staying. Every time the court warns you, you are going to be reimbursed. So if you have not asked in the past, I'm not certain that they will pay you because of fear of, you know, fraud and whatever. But if you asked on that particular day, I know that they will accompany you to the office of the clerk of the court and then they will process your money there so that you can be given your your monies. Okay, that's just a by the way, admin. So uh, yep, yep. even instances where, like I said, a state witness that the prosecutor has indicated that they are not going to call. And when you consult with your witness and you find that this witness will be useful to you, but you don't have the means to get them to be in court you can ask as the defense that the court assist to get that witness to be brought to court at the expense of the state. Sorry, um, ma'am, I have a question. Yes. So is it always the case that state witnesses are subpoenaed before they can appear before court or do some state witnesses volunteer themselves? There are people who volunteer themselves. So if you have volunteered yourself, the question becomes, is the state considering you a state witness that they will continue to use? So it becomes their own decision. Like I said, they are dominus litis. They decide who to use in their case. They decide who to charge, which charges to bring, who not to call. So if you are going to be useful to them, they will assist with that. Okay. Okay, thank you. I just want to check a few, few questions. Well, yes. you have mentioned that the, the, the prosecution or the state mm. cannot be forced to prosecute. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, it is true, but I just want to check uh, that in an event that, yes, I feel that a particular uh, case should be prosecuted and the, the, the prosecutor or the DPP decides not to do that. 
Mm. Um, uh, uh, well, I thought maybe you would also mention the issue of private uh, prosecution that you've got. It doesn't end there, but yes, you I may approach it uh, through a, you know, private prosecution. Yeah, I see it is common nowadays, but what I can say there, you are right. Yes, you are right. It's one of the options. But what is common, more common in practices within the National Prosecuting Authority, there's ranks, just like with the police. So you would most likely start with the stationed senior prosecutor at court when you make your representations. Mm. And if they, they don't agree, you know, with you, then you will go to their chief. That is the ranking. And then if the chief doesn't agree, because you can even request their reasons to be in writing, why they are not, you know, withdrawing or whatever you want. And if the chief doesn't agree, then you go to the DPP. And then if DPP doesn't agree, then you go to the NDPP. So, yes, I've seen that uh, those popular cases on the media, they are already you know, cases that are high profile. So they are already being handled at a much higher prosecuting authority level. Like the prosecutors in those cases are not your junior prosecutors in your ordinary uh, district courts and regional courts. So I guess it would make sense why if the defense lawyers, they, they don't get their way and already they are so high in the ranking, like in their consultations with the prosecution, that they may feel that they've made rep representations to the office of Ms. Badoi and they're not getting, you know, the joy that they're looking for, then they would opt for private prosecution. But on a day-to-day, -day, if it's just your ordinary cases down here on the, uh, the, the lower courts, then we follow that ranking before you ultimately have to seek uh, that kind of uh, prosecution. No, no, thanks, ma'am. In the interest yeah, of time, can I quickly also, because I just have got another question here. Well, you also spoke about the issue of, you know, as a defense practitioner, engaging mm. with the witnesses mm -hmm. uh, who are on the other side, who are of the state. Mm. Um, well, uh, I'm not so sure if I will be correct from what I have read. That uh, in an event, because they can also unfairly uh, disallow me to engage with the witness mm. uh, who happen to be the witnesses of the state, that I can as well approach the court and ask the court to force the prosecution uh, to allow the state to allow me to have an engagement with the, the witnesses, with the witness on the other side. But uh, Maybe lastly, so that I, I, I can actually, it is the issue um, of, you know, uh, witnesses. Uh, who becomes, how does a witness become my witness? M my understanding is that a witness becomes my witness because I was the one who firstly approached the witness. So if uh, the witness has not been approached, it belongs to either the state or the, the, the defense, depending as to whether or not I want that person to assist me in, in handling the issue of the case in favor of my client. Thank you. Yes, I would agree with you that a witness, we are, I think here on, your, on the last part of what you are saying, we are talking about those ones where they have not obtained with, uh, witness statements from them. For you to decide whether this is going to be a defense witness, then it would depend on the information that they are going to give, whether it's going to be helpful to you, because obviously if they're not going to be helpful to you, they might be actually helpful to the state. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the information that this person who hasn't given a statement whether their information or the, the evidence that you want to present is going to be useful to you. Then if you know that it's going to be useful to you, then you would even make sure that you mention it in court that it likes where I am talking about instances where maybe you don't have the resources to reach that witness. You can say, you know, I'm instructed by my client that there is 
a particular person by this name. We have an address that we want to furnish to the court so that the state can be of assistance to help us to get that witness to be brought to court. If they, they maybe they were not even aware of them. And sometimes they come to court. I've had personally and colleagues also I know. Sometimes you, from hearing from your client that you would think the person is going to be useful to you. And they come to court, you sit with them and you consult only to find that, yeah, they are burying your client. So now it's you have to, yes, this uh, anybody's witness that I'm talking about. So, so the state will help you to actually get the, so the police to go and subpoena them and they will actually show up. Sometimes they will even drive them and bring them to court, you know, and then you'll be given an opportunity to sit and consult. But when you consult, you find that their information is not favoring you. So then you will then have to now declare that no, for what you thought you will get out of that witness, they are not going to be useful. You don't have to say what they are saying, but you'll say that they will not be of, uh, of you any use to advance the defense case. Therefore, you will not be using them. Further, the state is at liberty to use them if they want, because you discovered them first. In such a situation, uh, is it possible that uh, the, um, the, the state can take a witness that was not uh, helpful to my defense and subpoena them to be they? They, they take witness. In the same way that the state can take an accused, an accused person who's been formally charged and turn them into a state witness. So you see, there are those uh, co-accused situations where one is giving evidence against the other and saying, yes, I was present at the scene of the crime, but I didn't really partake. Actually, accused number one is the one who did one, two, three, four, five, six, which is helping the state case. And now you as the lawyer of accused number two, you can approach the state with that information to say, this person is going to help your case. Consider using him as your own witness as the state on condition that after he has given you this information, you will withdraw the charges against him. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Let's move on. Now, on the other side of the coin, it's defense witnesses. So whatever I said regarding the state witness that you don't consult with them without the prosecutor, it also applies also with the accused that the state is not allowed to Consult with your witnesses in your absence. And this is to avoid a, a defense witness making statements that, you know, can be used, obviously, against them by the prosecutor. So the same way that uh, you will consult with the accused person, your consultation will be in writing, I mean, write, reduced into writing, signed, and dated, you do the same with a defense witness because people have a tendency to change. So you being the lawyer, you don't want a situation where after you've been informed something and tomorrow someone, uh, rather a witness turns and they, they will try and say, no, I never said that. So that is just a protection that you give yourself as a lawyer to say, this is the information that you told me today, please sign that I've reduced uh, everything that you've told me into writing. The same is done by the police, obviously, when they talk to the state witnesses as well, when they take down those uh, witness statements. So once you have established that there is a defense witness, for example, here I talk about an alibi. First thing to do, you need to thoroughly consult with this witness because when you have a, an evidence of an alibi, the prosecutors are trained very well on how to deal with such evidence. They cross-examine them extensively, and in most instances, if you are unprepared, they will be discredited. So when I say consult thoroughly, 
please, you are an officer of the court. We get instructions from our clients. We take instructions from defense witnesses regarding the events. You may discover when you spoke to the client that is the accused, and also later when you consult with your defense witnesses, that there are discrepancies between what they are telling you. You are obviously in a situation where you are having a confidential discussion with your client. So you can point out those discrepancies to say, uh, for instance, remember this person is supposed to be corroborating the evidence of the accused. You can point out those inconsistencies and say, but accused said this, uh, what do you say to that? You don't say, why do you disagree with the accused here? You must agree with them. Now you are putting yourself in a place where you are putting a version on this witness. You see, your job is not to give them a version that they will go and give to the court when they testify. You can show them the inconsistencies so that they can explain it to you so that it makes sense for you who's going to present the evidence. Your duty is not to mislead the court. And I'm, I'm coming. Let me finish up. I'm, I'm almost done at this, uh, with this slide. Now, when you are uh, dealing with a, a, a witness in court, remember you will have to put the version of the accused, it depends obviously also on the case that you're dealing with, but in most instances, you will have to put your client's version to the witnesses in order for them to give a reaction, whether they are agreeing with the accused or with that state, I mean, defense witness or not. That is why you need a, a, a version that makes sense, that is logical, so that you can be able to, to present it in a logical and concise way to the court so that it doesn't look confusing. That's what I mean. But you don't put words in their mouth. You don't tell them, don't say this, say that. You don't. Because if you do, you are influencing your witnesses. And first of all, it's unethical to do so. And number two, when they get caught out that they are lying, when they are under heat, when they are under fire by the prosecution and they are breaking, they will say, okay, it's my lawyer who told me I must say it like this. So you don't want to be that guy who is known to influence witnesses on how they should testify. Okay, thank you. Let's hear the comment or question. I just want to check that uh, can you, as a lawyer, be charged with perjury in an event that it is proven that you told your 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 witness to say something which uh, is not true. And lastly, I want to check one one thing. I wanted to to check uh, or on the very same net. The issue of me consulting with the, the witness, does it change if the evidence has been led or the evidence has not been led that I should be, uh, you know, the, uh, accompany the my witness in an event the state wants to uh, interview my witness? Thank you. OK. Uh, yes. Wait, wait. <laughs> You, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I got lost a bit. Um, okay, I've said the, you, the witness must tell you in their own words. So if someone is telling you in their own words of the events, first of all, you were not there. You are hearing from them. So they should know more about what transpired than you. All you do is to help them to structure how they are formulating their story. You don't have to, you know, if, for instance, if you find that the witness is, is blabbering on and getting out of line with what you want to get at, you can just guide them, even when they are testifying in open court. When you find that they are, they are talking something which is totally irrelevant, you bring them back 
you can do that. But you are not telling them what to say. You are just helping them, guiding them on how they should testify. So there's a difference. I hope I've answered you there. Okay, ma'am. Mm. Can I ask a question? Mm. It means you cannot interview a defense witness in the in the presence of the accused you are lying. Look, I don't I don't recommend that. But there are instances where, where remember, ideally what I do, I would talk to the accused first. And obviously when I talk to them, they will tell me that, no, I actually have this witness. And then I'll say, okay, let's arrange for that witness to come. The day the witness comes, then I will talk to the witness alone. Remember, I've got the story of the accused already. Now, after hearing both sides, if I see that there's inconsistencies, I can call them together. My discussions with them are confidential. Remember, we are covered by privilege. My discussions, if I see that there are, uh, you know, differing here and there, I can help them to structure their, their story, not to say a particular thing. I'm just helping them for them to be consistent with each other. That is what I can do. Then I can consult with both of them. It's allowed. But what I'm not allowed to do is to tell them what to say. The story must come from them. I can help them to just see that, okay, we clarify. For instance, if said, no, the T-shirt was yellow, then I'll say, okay, but I just said the T-shirt was yellow. You are saying the T-shirt was red. Can you, between yourself, decide, was it yellow or was it red? Then they will talk to each other and they'll be like, no, 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 you don't remember well. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. Okay, it was yellow. Then I know they told me that it was a yellow T-shirt. And when I go there, I'm going to say, they are saying it's a yellow T-shirt. It's not me who says it was a yellow T-shirt. That is how I iron out those type of situations. I didn't tell them, you guys must say it is yellow. No. I'm saying, clarify, was it red or was it yellow? Then they will decide for themselves whether it, and then I will take what they tell me that, okay, it was yellow. All right. Are we done, guys? I move on. Yeah, maybe, uh, ma'am, just to uh, get clarity on what you are saying. Um, so here's the thing. Let's say somebody has killed somebody. Um, and now maybe the strategy is to um, build, plead not guilty. Um, in reality, this person would have killed, but then if your line of defense is to deal with maybe prove that maybe that matter did not happen or whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe how do you deal with that if you are saying you would not necessarily tell them uh, certain things? So the charge is made. Somebody has died. The state yes. is saying this person was murdered. Yeah. And then how do I get to... Are they pleading guilty or what are they, are you saying? What are you saying? Are they pleading to have intentionally killed this person? Or are you saying they have an explanation to why that person ended up dead at their hands? Come again? Are you saying when the charge is put to the accused that it is murder, the accused yeah. who's our client is admitting mm. to have deliberately and intentionally killed this person. Or the accused is saying, yes, I actually am the one who led to the death of this person, but for me to have ended up taking the life of this person, this is what happened. And according to me, it was not my intention, but these are the circumstances that led to that. Then we establish from there. Uh, maybe let's let's take the first one. If um, maybe they want to deny before court, I'm not sure if that is possible. Okay, the first one that I explained, I don't know if maybe we're getting each other. It would be them admitting the charge as it's put on the charge sheet that they intentionally killed without any excuse. They are admitting mm. that they had no good reason 
they just went and killed this person. Maybe they hated him or her. And yeah. they just waited for that special day to kill them. That one is a guilty plea, straightforward. And then this one who says, yes, I did cause the death of this person, but before I ended up in this situation that this person died in my hands, we were actually involved in a fight. And this is what ensued. They are the ones who actually, during an argument, they, they beat me first and then we were busy fighting and I felt that, you know what, this beating that I'm getting from this person is too much for me. And then I decided to take a, a vase that was on the table and I just hit them on the head and that's how they died. Is that a guilty plea? Yeah, maybe in that case it's like... It's raising self-defense. Okay. So that one, yeah. you can't plead guilty. Then you have to now go and establish whether that person was justified in how they acted. And the court will have to make a decision whether they are guilty or not. That's how it works. So I don't put any words. No, I like ask nothing. what happened and they tell you what happened. And then you can help them to see whether they were the ones who were guilty or whether they, they do actually have a defense. Okay. Are we can moving? I ask, can I um, ask um, my um, um, a leading question? A leading question? Yes, can I ask my witness a leading question? We are coming to that. Let's leave it um, for the future. Okay. We are going to get to that. Yes? Yes. yes. What happened in a situation whereby a client have committed this crime of murder, but still don't want to be convicted for it. And he comes to you and says, I need your assistance. I need to be uh, prepared for, for this, or I need to be defended for this uh, charge and stuff. What do you do as a defense when lawyer? When you say I want to be defended, the two scenarios that I've just given you will help you to see. You ask them, they are saying you intentionally killed this person by stabbing yes. them with a knife seven yes. times. Did yes. you have any good reason to do so? And what was happening when you did that? And if you find that there's no good defense, then you will tell them, no, you don't have a defense. But if on the second uh, scenario that I gave you now, you hear that this person says, no, there was an altercation, they actually were fighting, then obviously the instructions there is that whatever I did that killed this person eventually was an act of defense, then they can't plead guilty, then you have to go to trial. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm we move. Sorry, may I ask a question quickly? Yes. Yeah, what happens when the client uh, just takes a complete turn on the stand, um, decides to be disingenuous and dishonest, lie about you, um, the, defen the defense lawyer, and uh, says that you said you said some things and you insinuated or you told her to say certain things in court and you never did that you didn't say that and worse yet the other witness um which we're also consulting with this one uh, seems to to back up this one and you know um allude to the same you know allegation so what do you do as a defense lawyer do you perhaps maybe uh, do away with this privilege um, that you have between the client and, you know, the attorney, or you, I don't know, what perhaps happens in such a case? That is why you see the first thing I said, witnesses, accused is a defense witness and or whoever he calls to back up his story. Consultation statements to be made in writing, signed and dated. So that is, for anyone, maybe if they want to report you to the LPC, you produce that and you say, this is what I was told. And if you feel that the insults are obviously of such a, a serious nature, the allegations, obviously then I, um, I'm of the view that your relationship with your client has broken down because your client has to have full confidence in you. So they cannot slander you in front of a court and make false statements about things that you never said to them, then there's no good relationship there. It's a clear conflict. So you have to withdraw from that case. Yeah. You can't continue to do their, their best on some or for someone who's busy making false accusations against you. They've turned against you. They're not 
for you anymore. So you can't be for them. So you have to withdraw. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, just for the record, uh, I think the slides that you've been given, uh, I think it's four sets. So we have five days. I'm very confident that we will get to all of them. Just for those who've been on uh, the worried mode. But as you can see, when I get to something that I've covered already, then it makes us to move faster. So I don't mind if we do have these discussions a bit so that it towards the end, you will see most of the staff who would have already dealt with it. So we'll just be wrapping, um, uh, running over them just for the sake of not jumping them. So we'll be able to cover me. everything. Yes. Ms. Alfie, if I can just yes. ask a question. When mm. we were given the link for the class, we we're also given a program in terms of what will be discussed on each day. And some mm. of us prefer prepare for the class based on the program. So mm. if we're going to deviate from that program, can you then give us a highlight of what then we need to prepare for the next class, please? Mm -mm. We are not deviating. If you can take your time, go. the slides are a lot. So everything that is on the program is going to be covered on the slides. They told me when they gave me the program is just to ensure that uh, everything that is on the program will be covered on the slides. So, excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Sorry. Um, then, ma you. Um, but um, my question is not preparing for the class. If sorry, I was still finishing up my question. If we are then saying, okay, I understand that we are going to finish all the slides, but my question is. If let's say the day had until the indictments, right? So we prepared for that class based on that program. But if obviously we don't cover that today, we might not cover everything tomorrow. So if maybe at the end of the class, you can say tomorrow we're going to be looking at this section or this section just for preparatory purposes so we know what to look at before we come to class. From what I can tell you, I saw that 7 February, it's supposed to deal with, a, I'll show you why even it flows. It deals with a plea of guilt, right? As the last uh, methods of disposing of a case. Yes. From the, yeah, the second last yes. item there. Then it says plea of guilt. Then 8th of February, it also says methods of disposing of a case. Plea of guilty again. So what are you saying to me? Okay, that's fine. We can move on. You see? So that is um, what I'm saying. I I tried to work with it, but I realized that everything will be covered. So, yeah, that's what I can say there. Because uh, according to it, I'm asking myself, am I supposed to repeat the methods of disposing of the case again on the 8th when I've dealt with it on the 7th? And also guilty, guilty plea, if I've done it on the 7th, am I supposed to repeat it on the 8th? What I can tell you, the slides were formulated based on the manual. Um, ma'am, sorry. Yes. Um, I'm just reiting from the topic a bit. I'd like to know the slides. Uh, will this aid us in our assessments, the MCQ questions that we need to answer? Yes. Or do we need to look in the book as well? You need to look at the book as well. Okay. You can look at the book as well because, like, mm. some of the items I'm brief, you know, so if yeah. you would like to have an expanded knowledge of it, you can read on more. I try, obviously, to cover everything. But ladies and gentlemen, did you see how thick is that manual? Mm, yes. So do you honestly want me to cover each and every line and every page that is on that manual? I'm going to make sure that everything that is of essence, of great importance, something that you are likely to meet, you will need to know how to tackle it, is going to be covered on the slides. But I will not be um, reading. I'm, I'm not going to, because I know you guys can read, so I'm not going to repeat the manual word for word for you. Uh, but the, the structure sorry, is based. Sorry? Sorry, ma'am, to disturb you. I'd mm. just like to know the assessment, like, basically, uh, when do you advise us to start taking it, start doing it? Um, Immediately when I say thank you, we are done. Okay. You okay. will be, in fact, I'm saying to you, go to court after I'm done here. 
<laughs> go, and, go and write your board exams because we would have covered everything that I know in the boards, in your assessments, you will deal with it. Okay. And um, then do, you, do you have previous exam papers? No, I don't. But the website of the LPC has the question papers. You mean for the school or for the board exams? For both. For the schools, and I had, I used to be asked to make the the uh, the exam uh, questions and assignments, but then I I don't anymore because they told me some assignments were stopped. It's only exams, so I don't have anymore. But don't panic, guys. You will be equipped. I promise you, because that is why. Okay, maybe you may not agree with my style. You prefer someone to preach for you and you just consume, consume, consume. But for me, the best way to learn is to be engaging because as we are we are together on you know the slides and we are talking about them. For me, that is the best way of learning because you are applying what is you know being uh, put out on the slides to whatever you know situation that you think you may you may meet or whatever set of facts that may be thrown at you so yes okay you'll be fine believe me you'll be criminal lawyers in paper and in practice when we finish it okay i proceed thank you so the accused i've touched on and uh, your relationship with your client as the legal representative, I have already touched on it to say, uh, you know, you are bound by the rules of ethics. You don't do anything that is going to compromise you as the lawyer, though we know you are acting in their best interest, but you are not there to mislead the court. So yes, mostly, the accused persons are lay persons, which means I'm not saying they are stupid. I'm saying they are not glued up that much in terms of the law. They may be in another field of practice. So you, the minute you place your name on the chat sheet, you are an expert in the law. Even if you come as a candidate legal practitioner, that is why the cases that have gone before the high courts where accused persons were represented by candidate attorneys and there were issues of inexperience and negligence on the part of the candidate uh, 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 attorneys that were raised, they did not fly with the judges because the minute you are on record, it is assumed that you know the law more than your client, even if they can be a professor of whatever. So please be mindful of this. And that is why it's very important that you make sure that each and every case that you are going to be given, you don't take it lightly because this will have an impact that can be very detrimental to your client. As we know, they may be found guilty in your hands and they may be given a sentence of imprisonment. So the outcome of your case can actually, you know, make or break a person's life. So it's very serious and we take it and treat it with uh, that kind of seriousness. So I've said enough about uh, the ethics. Please, it's also a, a very common question that how do you continue to represent someone who you know that they have, a, say for example, the charge is made that they have killed someone. And when you consult with them, they are raising a defense. We are lawyers, we listen to the background of the matter. And if we find that there is a defense that is uh, to be put on behalf of that person, you have to present that to the court. So you don't judge your client, you know, and assume that whatever is put on the chat sheet, they have done it. You have to sit down with your client. And I advise when you consult with an accused person, if possible, 
because there are instances where you don't have access to the docket. But when you do have access to the docket, read it first before you talk to the accused. Because you, you will find a situation where you hear a completely different story from the accused. And when you go and you read the docket, it's something else. So it, it saves you time and it also makes your consultation to move better and faster if you've already read the allegations that the state will be uh, making and the witnesses that are coming to testify, the type of evidence that they will be producing before the court, then when you are consulting, you can even confront your accused and say, this is the evidence that the state has against you. How are you going to answer to this? So that you can get properly prepared. Sorry, Elsie, sorry to disturb you. Yes. You, you mentioned something about sometimes you might not have access to the docket. Mm. So what would be the circumstances around that? What would actually be the factors um, keeping you away from accessing it? It's when uh, you are still applying for bail. At the stage where you are applying for bail and the investigations of the state are not yet complete, you don't have a right to access of the docket. Only when the state has pronounced that their investigations are concluded and they are ready to set the matter down for trial, the right to the docket now kicks in. Is it state versus Chabala? Yes. What is that? Yes. So that right to access of the docket, it's only when you are going to prepare for trial, not when you are going to prepare for bail. So at the stage of the bail, you can ask the prosecutors to see it. It's all up to them. If they don't want, they will just tell you by mouth or they will present you with a statement that is an affidavit that is prepared by the investigating officer briefly summarizing their case that they will present to the court. So you don't have a right to demand to be given the contents of the docket at the bail stage. And while the investigations are still ongoing. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to, to interject. I know um, I might be going out of topic, but I don't know if you um, can maybe elaborate a little bit more on um, what is the procedure of appearing in the high court? The same thing. You just have to be admitted. And then once you're admitted, you have to show that since your admission as a practicing attorney, there's no issue with the LPCs. And then you pay a certain fee. It's just a form that is standard. It's an administrative thing. It's not like an admission when you are being admitted for the first time after your articles then you just present that to the LPC. And if they've checked that you are in good standing, there's no disciplinary hearings, there's no uh, owing uh, membership fees, then they will present you with that certificate for high court. But obviously... Oh, um, I think somewhere that it says that you can appear in the high court after three years um, of um, post your admission. And there's another um, thing that says, um, unless you um, um, uh, enroll on the trial advocacy course, but it's not quite clear um, whether right after you, you, you finish with that course, you can appear or is there a time frame after that that um, you have to adhere to? I don't know the requirements of the LPC because things are changing there every day. But what I know when I was doing law school like yourself now, trial advocacy was part of the module. So I don't know when they say trial advocacy, they mean which trial advocacy. So you will have to consult with the LPC to check there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, another LPC. one. Sorry, Elsie. But I just want to know how... how, how um. The, val the validity of the certificate that you're issued by the LPC. It Which will be one? Until when? Which one? And for you to be able to represent the client in high, at high court. It's forever until there's no problem. Like you are not struck off the role of practicing attorneys. Then it's forever. As long as you are in good standing, 
like what I've mentioned, good standing means there's no problems with you as a lawyer. Then it's why, why? Yeah. Yeah. So you only apply once? You only apply once. The only thing is you apply several times because a right of appearance is issued as a candidate attorney, right? Upon your articles being registered. Then, uh, then you can move on to apply for regional court. I don't know the LPC now, guys. I don't want to lie. I'm I'm way old school. I'm at, I'm lost. But what is that? The old act. I know that uh, once you had done one year of your articles, you could apply for regional court. And even as a candidate legal practitioner, then after one year you can appear in the regional courts. Then you move on, obviously, to the third year where you could apply for high court. So I don't know now. You'll have to check. LPC has changed. They have their own requirements, like what our colleague just told us now. There's this thing about advocacy, which I didn't know. I thought it's part of the module at the law school. So I don't know. Please don't ask me administrative things of the LPC. I don't know. Please consult with uh, them on that. You are wasting your time here. So we are left with five minutes. Let me at least try and do up to slide number 15, and then we can call it the night. OK, so uh, I've talked already about a conflict of interest. I think I've given you a nice example where our colleague mentioned a situation of a client who turns against you and they now slander you and they make false allegations. That's a clear conflict of interest between you as the lawyer and your client. And obviously, I said you are ethically bound to withdraw from that matter because it will not be possible for you to act in the best interest of that client. Now, disagreements also between the attorney and the client concerning the instructions is a very common one, whereby I, I uh, told you that make sure that when you consult your Consultation must be reduced to writing because clients, they do tend to change. I'm not saying because they are bad people or what. I don't know. They adapt their stories as they maybe hear witnesses talking in court or whatever. So make sure that if there's any changes or any development that they are adding to their story, it's not only that initial consultation that you will write down. As long as it's not out of line, you can also continue to write it down because sometimes maybe they had forgotten to tell you about that issue, but only when a witness is testifying. Now they remember that, oh yes, by the way, there was also this situation. Then you also now have to add on your instructions and reduce it into writing. Let them sign that that is the story that they're telling you. But if they are completely changing their story, which they do, completely from what they had told you, then you are going to have a problem because the question will be when you go to trial, which matter, I mean, which story are you going to present before the court? If it's so completely different. Now, you also are already finding yourself in a situation where you are doubting even what they're telling you. So in that case, you will obviously not be able to uh, know which version to take to the court and with conflict conflicting versions given by the clients you have to withdraw and also when there is more than one client involved in the case they can implicate each other where i told you for example of that one who says i was also there but i'm not the one who robbed i saw them it's obvious that's another conflict you will not be able to represent both of these clients so you will have to withdraw. You can choose to withdraw entirely from the case, or you can choose <clears throat> the one that- You can't see your slide. You can't see number 14, but I'm on slide um, number We can see it. still see. Yeah, so but, we just see it. Yeah, so, but I'm just- saying, see it. Okay, so maybe you just need to restart the device, but we're about to finish. So if the client are pointing each other, for having committed the offense. You can't represent both of them. Then you have a conflict, then you will withdraw. Okay, do we have questions on conflict? Can I move to the last slide for the evening? No, thank you. 
Okay, this is the last issue I'm going to touch on. Transcribed records. Ne? So everything that happens in court, it's being recorded. That is why you will see that there's microphones that are attached to every desk point where the prosecutor is standing by the, uh, the lawyer, where the lawyer is sitting on the dock, where the accused is standing, where the witness box is, and also there by the magistrate. They are not loudspeakers. I include this deliberately because, please, this is a very big problem that we have in practice that maybe because they were not told. People, they think that, uh, you know, they can speak softly. And because the mic is so close to your mouth, it will be able to pick up everything that you are saying. So please, they are not loudspeakers. They are just recording what is being said in court. And it becomes a challenge should you need to have the record transcribed. Or maybe if you want to listen to the recordings that happened, maybe you were not there, you were not the attorney of record, and you are coming in and the matter is already in the middle. And you, you would want to just listen to hear whether everything that you would have wanted was covered, you know, by whoever dealt with the matter before. And you will find that it's inaudible. You can't hear. So I'm not saying scream and shout, but I'm just saying, please, it's a very common thing. When you read transcripts, it's like there are so many missing words because of the fact that the transcribers will write that that part was inaudible. So if you are able to pitch up your voice a bit, it helps to cover that issue. The second issue that is a problem is the missing tapes. Because in the past, they were using floppy disks that had to be, uh, they used to say they are writing it or I don't know. So with that process, then they came and they changed and they brought those things that look like com computers with flat screens. So in that transition period, there's a lot of missing tapes. This may not look like a problem, but if you are dealing with an appeal, that is where you will see that it is a problem because the judges will not want to proceed with hearing the appeal without a complete record. Because remember, they were not there. They will want to see everything that was said and done in the lower court so that they can make a, a, a their own ruling. So this causes crazy, crazy amount of delays. And sometimes really the person may be innocent, but only if you know a judge can actually hear them. Or even if it's your own case, if you found that you know, you have a very good case that your client is giving you on it or yeah, that uh, is, you know, defendable, but you would wish to see whether the person who was there before has covered all those bases that you would have wanted to, and you find that it's a problem. Reconstruction of the, of the record is possible, but it's also challenging now because, you know, the parties who had uh, actually done the trial they may no longer be traceable, people move away, people die, you know. So it eventually comes down to having to rely uh, on the notes of the presiding officer. Now, can we safely say that we are happy to rely on those notes? Because we know that presiding officers are also human beings. There's always a room for error. They, they are not machines that can record everything that is being said, no matter how fast they may be, you know. So I don't know how comfortable would you be when you came into the matter and you now have to rely on the notes of a presiding officer. Are we sure that they were awake the whole time? Because we know of those presiding officers who sleep when the, when they are, the proceedings are ongoing on the day those off. You know, so when they are in that moment of dozing off, something crucial could have been said and they missed on it. So that's the challenges that are there. A transcribed record is a very important, you know, part of the proceedings. And yeah, 
please be aware that, yeah, it's one of the challenges. I want to stop I here. Before you close, mm -hmm. I read that, um, the process of the, the accused being taken from the police station or holding cell to prison or from the court to prison. It says that um, the, 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 the accused, they are classified according to the type of offense that they were convicted of. And the, the classification, it plays a very important role in determining where, um, where they will be held in prison and the privileges that they will be entitled to. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are privileges, is like, is it different from person, for, from people who may be raped or committed murder or anything in, in prison? Is there any, any difference? No, I, for the ordinary folks on the street, it, there's no difference. What I know is with regard to minors, minors must be kept with minors. Females must be kept with females. Males must be kept with males. And then those classifications will be also, if you are having an accused who is a police officer, I know that they will not be placed with, you know, the other inmates for their safety. And if you also disclosed that, you know, I'm a legal practitioner, you may be given a privilege that you may be kept in a single holding cell. So those are the privileges that are there. But otherwise, everybody, it's mixing. Unless if there's a, an issue, like surrounding health, for instance, if this person has a contagious disease, then they will also, I mean, just an ordinary accused will be given a single cell so that they don't transmit what they have with the others, or they may be kept in the hospitals section of the prison. Those are the, the classifications that are there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay ma'am, I mm -hmm. just want to ask one question. Okay. Uh, I know uh, uh, presiding officers are not supposed to be biased in a case, but mm -hmm. like you rightly said, the human beings, you will find most cases you have a uh, you have a case in court and you can see clearly that the presiding officer have taken a side on this very case and whatever that the opposition is saying does not matter. He just go fast and make ruling and all that. How mm. do we handle this kind of situations? We'll come if to that. Are... We'll come to that. It's also on the slides where we are dealing with a recusal yeah. of the presiding officer. Okay. Okay. So uh, ladies and yeah. Elsie. One, yes. one question, sorry. In the training guide, they mentioned specific case law. Are we supposed to know those cases or can we just go through them for understanding or should we be able to refer to them in an assessment? Refer to them in the assessment and read them to get the gist of... Ntlantla, you are blessing us with your presence. Please uh, switch off your video. Uh, you go through them for the sake of expanding your understanding. As you can see, some other things I'm, I'm running through them. So if you want to get an in-depth, like for instance, on the issue of peace officer, as an example, you, you now have to go and give yourself the satisfaction that you are looking for. Then you go and read on it. And if you have a question that is uh, having those elements, when you're answering, then you mention it uh, that in the matter of so-and-so, this is how the court has dealt with it. Then it gives you extra masks a max when the assessment is done for effort. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Amen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are we now ready to close our session? We carry on until Friday. Yes, please. Can we just close? No, thank, thank you. you. That's, that's fine. Thank, thank you. you. I don't thank see. You. Thank you. Thank I have you, to Mama. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It was a lovely session. Please thank close. You. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Bye, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.